Our scripture lesson for this week comes from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branches cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Word of God for the people of God. This is probably one of the most difficult sermons I've ever had to preach. My heart is saddened at the uh, events that occurred during this last week. I watched with the rest of you as uh, teenagers young, and young people literally did all they could to tear apart Baltimore City, the city that I personally love. A lot of folks don't know this, um, but I have lived in and around Baltimore my entire life. I um, went to elementary school at Baltimore Highlands. I went to middle school in Lansdowne. I went to high school in Randallstown. I have college degrees from Loyola College and Johns Hopkins University. When my husband and I got married, we lived in Reisterstown and then Westminster and Mount Airy and now in Edgewater. And, and Baltimore is the only city I've ever claimed as my city. I used to work on the corner of Pennsylvania and West North Avenue, uh, right across or right at the location where that CVS pharmacy that was burned down is located. It wasn't there back in the 80s when I worked there. Back then, it was the number one drug district in the city. And I don't think much has changed um, as far as this particular area. I watched looting of stores. Those stores that were established by people who may never recover, no matter how good their insurance is. I watched fires ignite, both literal and figurative, uh, at what began with just some peaceful protests concerning a justice issue over the death of a young man. I watched total disregard for authority, sensationalized by the media. And I watched evil take the upper hand, just as you did. Many of you prayed overnight while evil just seemed to, to spread and, and, and win the fight. Many of you called loved ones with concern for their well-being. I know my, one of my first calls was to our music director, Alex, who lives in Baltimore. Many of you cheered on a particular mother who took it upon herself to pull her son away from the rioting acts that he was committing. And she sent him a clear message. Your actions are wrong and you will be held accountable. She was interviewed later. She said, he's her only son. She's a single mother. She did not want him to become another Freddie Gray. Many of you realize, as I do, that my beloved city of Baltimore, our beloved city of Baltimore, may never recover from this. And, and then we turn to scripture for today, and, and you kind of take a pause. We hear a, a promise from Jesus that we're the branches uh, connected to him as the vine, our, our life force. We find perhaps a bit of resolve as we watched our um, Islamic brothers. I don't know if you saw this, but there was a group of men from the Islamic church that stood, literally stood, between the rioters and uh, storefronts, trying to uh, calm folks down because uh, this particular church has good influence with this particular demographic. And so they were doing what they could. They were literally standing in the line of fire. We heard a message of a call for peace as over a hundred clergy uh, sat to the street and knelt in prayer just before a, a police barricade. We were not seeing the differences of 
our denominations or our status or religion. We saw unity in God. We saw a belief that what holds us together is stronger than what's trying to tear us apart. While others were screaming purge, our actions as followers of God are whispering hope. Some of you may have uh, been following, I, I, I've been following this television show called AD, I think it's, it's officially AD, The Bible Continues. Um, it's a show depicting the life uh, of the disciples after Jesus' resurrection and ascension into heaven. And notably, the script writers are holding very close to scripture, particularly the book of Acts. And what I find interesting is that when we talk about the massive and explosive and sudden growth of the church at that time, we sort of neglect or just kind of gloss over the huge and seemingly insurmountable obstacles that the disciples had to face. The continued Roman occupation meant brutality for anyone who stepped out of line. We cannot fully understand the fact that people were starving in order to pay their taxes to Rome. Any unrest in the region, uh, similar to what we witnessed by the rioters in Baltimore, any unrest in the region would have been met with death and destruction by the authorities. That was Roman's idea, uh, uh, Rome's idea of justice back at, the, at that time. If any of you have a Bible that includes some books in the middle known as the Apocrypha, uh, you may want to read uh, about the Maccabees. This group is responsible for a revolt against Rome that resulted in the outright massacre of everyone involved. That was Roman justice. You just sort of squashed any uprising as soon as it surfaced. On the other side of the table, we have the corrupt church of that time. The religious leaders of the church had an agreement with Rome to assist with keeping the peace. As long as taxes were paid and, and uh, order was maintained, the religious leaders were you know, given a, a bit of freedom to extort additional funds from the poor if they so chose. Uh, they were allowed their places of honor in the community. The, the comfortable living of church leaders was born on the backs of poor Jews attempting to follow God's law that was handed down to them uh, by Moses. And so in the midst of these two institutions of corruption, we find a group of ordinary laborers so changed by Jesus, the resurrected Christ, that they risk everything, everything, to share the gospel message. In spite of beatings, warnings, death threats, and hardship of every kind, the disciples could not keep Jesus' message quiet. Their, the message of peace and hope in troubled times resonated with thousands who flocked to the disciples' ministry like fans to a winning team. Peter, in particular, the disciple Peter, was gifted with the power of healing. And it was so strong that people would literally line up their sick along the, the sides of the street so that as Peter would walk by, his shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. The presence of Jesus turned hurting masses into disciples on fire for God, sharing all they had with one another so that no one went hungry or in need. And so today, church, I, I tell you, we're hurting. Today we're grieving the loss of life in a country called Nepal that is so far away, many of us don't even know where its location. And last I checked, the death toll was over 7,000 and anticipated to go well beyond 10,000 uh, as they, uh, folks have lost their lives in a massive earthquake that uh, presented itself in that region. Today we're grieving the loss of dignity and security for store owners and homeowners in Baltimore who saw their dreams just vanish in one night of evil. Today we're shocked and appalled at the aftermath following the funeral of a young man whose family was pleading for the end of violence and destruction. And so today, 
think we, we all are just a bit broken in spirit. Many in our world have decided to disconnect from the true vine. Many have decided that the church has no place in their hearts, their agendas, or their schedules. Many have decided following Jesus' teachings of love and peace is simply not worth the hassle. And yet only when we remain a part of the true vine can we know real peace. Only when we remain a part of Jesus can we see the ultimate victory. A time of no more sorrow, no more tears, no more heartache, no more death and destruction. It's interesting, this was pointed out to me this week uh, at, a, at a teaching session. It's interesting that when you look at the Bible in the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, the Bible begins in a garden. But when you flip to the back and, and into the book of Revelation, it ends in a city. A city with Jesus as its light. And I'm thinking that perhaps those images are not an accident. Jesus said, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Branches are designed to bear fruit. Branches that are firmly connected to the vine can withstand the storm of criticism, the storm of hatred, the storm of prejudice, the storm of indifference, the storm of greed, the storm of self selfishness, the storm of worry. Branches firmly connected to the vine can feel the love of Jesus pulsing through our very souls uh, as we face those extremely harsh winds and violent storms. Only when the wind challenges the branches do we realize just how strong our connection to the true vine really is. I can tell you, my faith was shaken this week, but I did not lose connection with the vine. And so as we go about our day, I, I share things... We shared things with like a song from Casting Crowns called I Will Praise You in the Storm. I encourage you to look that one up on YouTube or whatever your source. But also look at Chris Tomlin's song, You're the God of this City. Greater things have yet to come and greater things are still to be done in this city.